Consider this whole situation. There are just between three and 4,000 political appointees sitting atop millions of career federal employees and bureaucrats. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four-year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. Only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. Whether we go forward together with courage or turn back to policies that weakened our economy, diminished our leadership in the world, America's future will be in your hands. Hi, my name is Spencer Cradian, and I serve at the Heritage Foundation as Associate Director of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project, or Project 2025. This is a coalition of more than 40 conservative organizations in D.C. and out of D.C. And our goal is to ensure that the conservative administration that takes office in January of 2025 is ready on day one, ready with people, ready with policy, and ready with plans. Project 2025 is organized into four pillars. Pillar one is a policy book. It's gonna be released in the spring of 2023, and it's going to outline a conservative vision of success at each federal agency. We have almost 400 people who are contributing to this policy book. It's a lot to manage. Pillar two is a personnel database. We want Mr. and Mrs. Smith to come to Washington and we're gonna go out and identify and recruit people to be in this personnel database. People at high levels, people at low levels, and everybody in between. Pillar three is a series of trainings, just like this video. These are important because we want the people who go to Washington in 2025 to serve the next president to be well-trained, to know what to expect, and to have an idea of what they can do to restore greatness to our country. And then pillar four is a playbook, a game plan for each federal agency in more detail than pillar one, starting with the official transition period and going out all the way the first six months of the new administration. We need to know what at each agency needs to happen on day one. What needs to happen on day two, day five, day 10? Who are the people who need to be in place the positions that need to be filled immediately. That's pillar four. Each of these pillars plays a vital role in Project 2025. By way of introduction, I'm a former special assistant to President Donald Trump and associate director of presidential personnel. It was my job to staff the administration for the president at various federal agencies. And I'm honored to be doing much of the same work in my role with Project 2025 from outside of government. One of the highlights of my time in the White House was that I got to work with Caitlin Stumpf. She was my deputy, and she's now also here with me at the Heritage Foundation. And the two of us are gonna be doing this video together. Now, as we think about the federal government, we need to think about the federal workforce. It has about 2 million full-time non-military employees. And when you add in the contractors, the number is well more than 10 million. That's a lot of people. But the American people don't elect the bureaucrats. They don't elect the federal contractors. They elect a president. And the president's job is to faithfully execute the laws of our country. The president, of course, does not have the hours in the day to personally perform every function of government. So he outsources that to the bureaucracy by necessity to all of those federal employees and contractors. But he does have some help helping him are between three and 4,000 political appointees. These are the president's people, the people he brings with him to Washington, and they occupy government jobs. But they're not like what we might call the normal federal employees. They serve in accepted roles. 
Now in Washington, D.C., in this town, you frequently hear people say, my dad worked for 30 years at the Department of Labor, or my sister served five different presidents as a foreign service officer. Well, chances are that is referring to federal employees who are hired through the normal hiring process. There are all sorts of rules and regulations that govern that process. If you want a federal job, they look at your qualifications, your expertise, your work history, your salary history. It's supposed to be competitive and objective. If the Department of Energy is hiring a nuclear engineer who's going to be handling radioactive waste, clearly there are some very specific qualifications that are needed. If the IRS is hiring an HR manager, perhaps less uh, expertise is needed. But the point is that those federal employees are not at risk of losing their jobs with a change in presidential administration. In fact, they have incredible job security. You've probably read stories or heard examples, but the federal government is notorious for its inability to fire virtually anybody. Even if an employee is in trouble, there are hearings, appeals, benefit of the doubt always gr granted, and it's very rare that the federal workforce will actually fire one of its own. But accepted service, the kind that political appointees engage in, is not subject to these same rules and these same standards. These three to 4,000 appointees serve at the pleasure of the president, and they can be removed by the president at any time. So they don't enjoy the usual perks of federal service. But the converse of that, the three to 4,000 political appointees don't apply through the competitive process. Their qualifications are not evaluated by career federal HR departments. They're there because the president wants them there and they serve the president. Consider this whole situation. There are just between three and 4,000 political appointees sitting atop millions of career federal employees and bureaucrats. Is that really enough? The president brought those few thousand people with him to change the direction of the government. And the president is expected to deliver what he ran on. The appointees are the ones who make it happen, those three to 4,000 people. In fact, it would be impossible for the president to change anything without them. Is three to 4,000 political appointees enough to turn around that federal battleship? Think about it. These are the only people at their agency who are accountable to the president and who serve at his pleasure. What does the number of appointees suggest about the president's accountability to the people who really matter, the voters? Or imagine what would happen if almost all federal employees opposed a certain president. Would you bet on a, just a few thousand people to overcome the massive federal bureaucracy? Some people want to reduce the number of political appointees or reclassify more positions as reserved for career employees and not political appointees. Some on the right even say that we, because we believe in small government, should just lead by example and not fill certain political positions. I suggest that it would be almost impossible to bring any conservative change to America if the president did that. So. Who are these political appointees? Well, some you've heard of. Some are household names. The Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, really any cabinet secretary. But those are just a small fraction of all political appointees. Most political appointees are people you haven't heard of. Now, the ones I mentioned, like the cabinet level people, those are what we call PASs, or Presidential Appointment with Senate Confirmation. Their offices are created by statute, and their salary is set by law. In addition to presidential appointments with Senate confirmation, there are also PAs, presidential appointments that don't require Senate confirmation. An example of a PAS is the Deputy Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. An example of a PA, presidential appointment without Senate confirmation, is the treasurer of the United States. But that's not all the political appointees. The ones who aren't appointed by the president directly, 
are hired under various authorities, various hiring authorities. The most common authority is Schedule C. This refers to accepted federal service that is confidential or policymaking in nature. Schedule C's include 22-year-olds just out of college working their first job. They include seasoned veterans of multiple administrations who've come out of retirement to work for the president they love. And they include everybody in between. A majority of political appointees are Schedule C appointees. Another prominent hiring authority that is used for political appointees is the Senior Executive Service, or SES, specifically non-career SES. The Senior Executive Service was established during the presidency of Jimmy Carter in the 1970s, and it was designed to ensure that well-qualified people could serve in the federal government at executive levels above the normal civil service. About 10% of SESs can be non-career or political. So a good percentage of political appointees are hired under SES authority. Many senior political appointees, not exactly household names, but known among the Beltway political class are non-career SES appointees. Now every four years, the government publishes a report to Congress on policy and supporting positions. It's informally known as the Plum Book, and I highly recommend that you check it out. In December of 2020, the most recent Plum Book, across all federal agencies, there were 1,118 PAS positions, presidential appointment with Senate confirmation. There were 354 PA positions, presidential appointment without Senate confirmation. There were 724 non-career SES positions, and there were 1,566 Schedule C positions. That's a total of 3,762, right between that three to 4,000 number that I mentioned earlier. Now, the federal bureaucracy is very complicated, and there are all sorts of rules about creating new positions that are accepted there are all sorts of rules about what happens when someone who's nominated for a Senate-confirmed position is still awaiting confirmation by the Senate, and who can be acting in that role in the meantime. But those are stories for a different video. For now, think about those approximately 3,700 political appointees that I mentioned. They serve at the pleasure of the president. Sometimes we all get a reminder that they serve at the pleasure of the president, like when the president fires a cabinet secretary. But in fact, all political appointees serve at the pleasure of the president. What must they be thinking about as they go into their office every morning? What pitfalls do they need to watch out for? And how on earth did they get there in the first place? Well, as I mentioned, Caitlin Stumpf was my deputy at the White House and is now my colleague at the Heritage Foundation. And Caitlin's going to explain a little more about how these people did get to where they are. So... We just learned about several types of federal jobs. And I bet you're wondering, how can I obtain a political appointment in the next presidential administration? Well, the answer is PPO. PPO stands for the Presidential Personnel Office. It's an office in the White House that acts on behalf of the president to meet his staffing needs. It is structured like many other offices in the White House. There's a director who is an assistant to the president, perhaps a deputy director and associate directors who are often special assistants to the president, and various other staff who report to the director and his associates. The main mission of PPO is to identify, recruit, and evaluate candidates for all political appointments and nominations across the federal government. Some questions that PPO may help answer include, who will be the ambassador to France? Who will be the chief of staff at the Department of Commerce? Who will serve as a senior advisor to the Secretary of the Treasury? And who will fill that entry-level position at the Department of Housing and Urban Development? This is where PPO comes in. Now, each role is unique, and for those higher level positions, such as the ones in the president's cabinet, the president likes to select those people himself. However, PPO can still have a role to play here. They can still identify and pass along candidates to be interviewed by the president. It depends on the administration, but the director of PPO and the president will meet to go over three important topics, new and upcoming vacancies, the ongoing nomination process, 
and how the political appointees across the federal government are serving the president. There are two important points to remember when thinking about PPO and staffing. First, for higher level positions that require Senate confirmation, it is up to the Senate to determine when to convene and vote on these nominees. Second, PPO focuses on federal agency hiring, not White House hiring. So, each head of every White House office is able to staff his or her own office. PPO shapes the various federal agencies because it is the entity that acts on behalf of the president to ensure robust and effective political management of those agencies. We've also discussed the difference between accepted federal service and the regular career federal hiring process. An important difference to remember is who does the evaluation of a candidate's qualifications. When it comes to political appointments, PPO is the agency acting on behalf of the president determining if a candidate is qualified. It's not relevant if the media or other people in the administration disagree about the person's qualifications. If PPO believes in them, then they have the job. Now, a brief digression is in order here. We just talked about political hiring, which PPO does. But PPO still works with the Office of Personnel Management, or OPM. That office is responsible for creating HR policy for all federal employees. Suppose you have a federal employee who is delinquent or failing at their job. How many warnings should be issued to this person? Who should be responsible in issuing them? What if the employee alleges that despite what it looks like, they are actually suffering from retaliation or discrimination based on their sex or race? OPM, OPM, OPM. OPM is the entity that would deal with all of these questions. One thing we understood during our time in the Trump administration is the importance of retaining political control over OPM. There were several career employees in powerful positions that hindered the work of the president and his staff. These were later replaced by political appointees. OPM is the federal entity that actually processes the paperwork of political appointees once PPO has selected them. It is vital for PPO and political leadership of OPM to have a productive working relationship and to speak regularly about personnel strategy. If PPO is the who, OPM is the how. Once PPO selects someone to be hired, OPM is responsible for onboarding them. There are many issues that affect the federal workforce that go beyond the typical HR issues we are all familiar with. For example, how many political appointees are there? Can there be any new roles created? Which positions, if any, are reserved for career federal employees and why? Which federal employees are considered essential during a pandemic, a blizzard, or a government shutdown? Under what authority should non-career federal employees be hired? And what is the process for converting a Schedule C employee into a career federal employee? OPM makes crucial decisions about these sorts of things. OPM also has an important role to play when it comes to security clearances. Political appointees, especially those at the Senate-confirmed level, require security clearances to complete their jobs. OPM plays a role in the speed of this process. Because personnel is policy, as the saying goes, PPO is in many ways the key to a successful administration. But if PPO and OPM do not have alignment, there will not be any success. So PPO, the Presidential Personnel Office, decides who gets a job as a political appointee. And OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, makes it happen. But what does the process look like for you the prospective appointee. Well, first, you should assess your own interests and your own qualifications. Do you believe in the president's vision? Do you believe in the agenda that he set out during the campaign? Or are you just looking to advance your own career? You can't be a political appointee if you don't believe in the president's vision. It's a tough job, too. You need to be willing to work long hours, to work on weekends, you need to be willing to implement the decisions of your bosses and not just march to the beat of your own drum. You gotta be a team player for the boss, the president. Think about what the president campaigned on. Think about what he promised the people who voted for him. What do they expect from the president? And what do they expect from you? The president can't do it all on his own. He doesn't have the hours in the day. Some of it has to be done by the political appointees. So what are you gonna do? And what are you going to do when the media goes after you? What are you going to do when the going gets tough? Those are questions that you need to be asking yourself if you're interested in being a political appointee. Now, there are a few practical things that you should also know. One of which is that you're probably going to have to live in D.C., the swamp. Most political appointments, the vast majority, are located in the Washington, D.C. area and you're gonna to have to relocate at least 
during the work week. There are a few positions like state directors at certain agencies and regional administrators at certain agencies that are located outside DC. But for the most part, you've gotta be willing to live in DC. The second thing that you should know is that it's much easier in all areas of the federal hiring process if you haven't broken the law. So obey the law and we will have fewer problems with background checks and paperwork for the hiring process. And then the only thing I would say that completely precludes you from serving a president as an appointee is if you don't agree with the president's vision. If you're gonna wreck, undermine, and take cheap shots at the president or at other people in his administration, then you definitely cannot be a political appointee. I also recommend that you familiarize yourself with the Plum Book, which I mentioned earlier. It will give you an idea of what positions are available for political appointees, what titles they have, what kinds of positions they are. It'll also give you a little bit of an indication uh, about pay. Now, most federal employees are paid along the general schedule or the GS, and it's a good approximation of what you'll expect to make as a political appointee. Note that in DC, there is locality pay, which reflects the fact that it's more expensive to live here than in most of America. But also remember that PPO decides how much to pay its appointees within the scope of the law. And you are not going to be on the normal federal uh, hiring process, and you aren't necessarily going to be on the GS scale, the GS schedule, but it's a good approximation of what you can expect. If you're making millions of dollars a year in the private sector, then you're certainly gonna get a pay cut if you become a political appointee. If you're just about to graduate college and looking for your first job, then being a political appointee might seem like a lot of money. And then of course, there's everybody in between. But you and your family should have realistic expectations regardless, and you should familiarize yourself with the general schedule and the Washington DC locality pay. If you wanna be an appointee, I also recommend that you network. Network, network, network. Everything in DC is about who you know. So get involved in politics, volunteer for candidates and causes you care about, go to happy hours, go to events at conservative organizations and on Capitol Hill, and always treat others with respect because you never know in Washington where your next job is gonna come from. It's not unusual at all to work for someone who was once your intern. So. When you're being considered for a political appointment, you're going to interview with PPO, the Presidential Personnel Office. Let's assume that you're not being considered for a cabinet level role. You'll probably meet with one to two PPO staff who have a certain portfolio, and they're gonna interview you for a position. Sometimes they are considering you for a specific position, they have you as a candidate in mind, and sometimes they're just getting to know you and figuring out your qualifications, and trying to determine where you would best fit in the administration. Caitlin and I have done hundreds of these interviews. In addition to the typical questions that you're going to get asked at any job interview, PPO is probably also going to ask you to describe your political views, to talk about what attracted you to the president's campaign. PPO is going to ask you to talk about what you want to do on behalf of the president at the relevant agency. PPO also might ask you to name some public figures or other politicians whom you admire, who you look up to. That's all part of the PPO interview process. As in any interview, it's important to remember to put yourself in the other person's shoes. You know, when I was interviewing people on behalf of President Trump, he wasn't there. So I had to ask myself, what would the president want me to ask this person? What would he say if he were sitting right here? What is he looking for in this kind of position? No one is entitled to just work for the president. PPO has to make that decision. I will also say that everybody who comes before PPO will be treated with respect. PPO will act with integrity. PPO will put themselves in the other person's shoes as well. Now, there's just a side note here. You know, it can feel like a big deal to be interviewing at the White House for a job, to be talking to somebody who represents the President of the United States, the most powerful man in the world. But think about all the people who came before you and think about all the people who will be political appointees well into the future. It's a real honor to be considered to work for the president. And I hope that I never lose a sense of awe that I had 
when I spoke for the president, when I interviewed people on his behalf. The bottom line is that if you're smart, if you're willing to work hard, and if you share the values of the president, PPO is gonna like you. And PPO is gonna get you into the administration one way or another. We'll find you the right seat on the bus, but it's important to get people onto the bus early in an administration, the right people. PPO also is going to support you as an appointee. That's what PPO likes to do. It likes to support the best appointees, promote the best appointees, and hear what they're doing at their agencies to advance the president's agenda. Remember, it's also possible that PPO will want to re-interview all of its appointees. There's always high turnover in administrations and people move around between agencies frequently, especially between a president's first and second term or after the midterm elections, things like that. Think about this from PPO's perspective. Does PPO want to interview you one time, give you a job, and then never hear from you again? Or does PPO want to interview you, give you a job, and form a relationship with you and learn about what you're doing through your work at an agency to advance the president's agenda? I think it's the second one. After your PPO interview, if PPO selects you, your information will be sent to the White House Liaison's office at the relevant agency. White House liaisons are chosen by PPO to be PPO's eyes and ears at various federal agencies. There's usually a liaison, a deputy, and several other staff. It's the liaison from the White House to the agency, not the other way around. When PPO indicates that a candidate is a choice for a position, the White House Liaison's Office starts the paperwork. It's an exciting time. So how long does it take? Well, it depends. One of the things I'm most proud of is that during my time in the Trump administration, we greatly reduced the time it took to get people started in political appointments. Early on, it took months and months. In my own case, it was nine months from the time I first interviewed until I started at an agency. But later on, with PPO and White House liaisons on the same page, we were working much faster. And one of the great things about Project 2025 is if we're successful, we're gonna be in a position to get thousands of people hired into the new administration in the very first days, just like the Biden administration did, and unlike the bureaucratic delays that often hamper conservative hiring efforts. As long as we have a strong PPO, strong White House liaisons and deputy White House liaisons, and strong aligned political leadership at the Office of Personnel Management, it won't take more than a few weeks to get you started. Of course, I should say, if you are nominated for a Senate-confirmed position, I can't exactly predict what the Senate will do. But part of Project 2025 is we're going to come up with confirmation and nomination strategies, horse trading with senators to get our people confirmed as quickly as possible. As an appointee, you'll definitely want to get to know your White House liaison. White House liaisons are a great resource. They can get you additional staff. They can help you do your job. And they're always working with PPO and political leadership at the Office of Personnel Management to give the president the personnel he deserves. Project 2025 will be hosting a White House liaison school in the near future. And I encourage all of you to watch that training as well. It's been debated in various conservative administrations over the years, loyalty versus experience. There are good arguments that loyalty and ideology in political appointees are more important than experience. President Nixon supposedly said that he preferred experienced people. President Reagan rejected this false dichotomy. While it's true that different administrations have different priorities, one thing is clear. If a president gets the wrong personnel who are not loyal to his agenda, he will pay a steep price. We've seen that over and over again. If you wanna be a political appointee, you can be a political appointee if you're aligned with the president. You don't need a master's in public policy. You don't need to have spent your career in Washington, D.C. You don't need to have written 40 academic articles. You don't need to have litigated billion dollar cases or argued in front of the Supreme Court. The career federal HR bureaucrats don't decide who's qualified to be a political appointee. PPO decides who's qualified to be a political appointee. The president was elected by the people to exercise 
the executive authority vested in him by the Constitution. He outsources some of that authority to PPO, and PPO hires political appointees who are going to get the president's work done. So what can you do? Well, the short answer is go to project2025.org today. Fill out our questionnaire. Send us your resume. Get in touch with us. The long answer is get more involved in Project 2025. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we have a policy book that will be released in the spring of 2023. Read it. If you agree with it, you'll feel right at home in our personnel database, which you can again find at project2025.org. If you like this training video, we're going to be doing a lot more, and I hope you'll watch them. Once you've read the book, put yourself in the database, and gotten trained up, we're gonna put you to work. We need people to draft executive orders, draft regulations, and think about personnel strategies, nomination strategies, and confirmation strategies across the federal government. Only then will we be ready on January 20th, 2025. Think about the issues that will face the administration that takes office in 2025. Think about what our country will look like in 2025. Think about what you like to do. Are you a policy person? Are you good at administrative stuff? Do you like human resources or information technology? There are political appointments in all of those categories. If you like to travel, maybe advance would be good for you because the president and the secretaries take a lot of cool trips. If you wanna be in political communications, you're halfway there already if you're a good writer. Have you worked previously on Capitol Hill? Have you worked for a governor? or state legislators. There are a lot of political appointments where that experience can come in handy. As long as you share the values that must drive the next administration, as long as you're willing to work long hours on behalf of the president and his priority, and as long as you demonstrate courage under fire and a proven track record of holding firm under pressure, you can be a political appointee. You can bring the conservative change to Washington that we all need. Visit project2025.org today and put yourself in contention for a role in the next administration. Thank you so much for watching this training video. I hope you'll stay involved in Project 2025 and spread the word to your friends and family. Thank you.